The scientific revolution starts now. It might be nice to just preface the conversation so that people have an understanding of why this is an important subject. So you did this four-part series that, that we checked out about the yeah. ether, and in particular about the elastic ether. And I think that we just want to be able to fold people in who might not be scientists, who aren't really aware of the fact that material reality kind of crumbles at, the, at this uh, large cosmic scale and the quantum yeah. level. Like, it's not... We don't really treat reality in material forms anymore and that happened Mm. really abruptly but prior to relativity and quantum mechanics it was very much an active pursuit right where Mm -hmm. people were trying to come up with ways that basic material objects could accomplish electricity and magnetism and light and gravity and these things Mm -hmm. and so in some sense the shift away from this might seem like a sort of meaningless esoteric pursuit but on the other hand it's a really really useful tool to people because if you can imagine what the materials are doing then you can visualize it and you can actually get a sense of how physics unfolds and so Mm -hmm. i don't think that it's just this uh you know pointless endeavor to try to come up with material explanations for these tiny little phenomena these invisible actions at a distance and so forth Uh because it really empowers people to be able to understand their world and of course we live in an era right now that's dominated by technology and it's it's a very techno science era where what you need is equations that are predictive so that you can accomplish things it's it's all applied physics let's say in the west at least uh in america definitely and so i just wanted to preface the conversation with laying out this paradigm under which all of the topics we're going to discuss are unfolding, which is in this deep history of, of antagonism between, you know, rational mechanics and something more like empirical technology, empirical engineering, and so forth. And it's, uh, there's a really, really beautiful tapestry in the culture that's at play as well. And I hope we can explore that and how it is that we landed on the the purely mathematical in our modern day, and you know, if 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 you think it'll persist as well, I, I hope we can discuss that. Uh, if there's yeah. a need for these kind of mechanical models and what that would look like, yeah, uh, there is a couple of, of important points you mentioned. I, I don't even know where to start, but well, uh, if we talk about motivation, I think that's a very important point. Why we should bother at all? about these uh, explanations about uh, asking ourselves where does electrodynamics come from and so on and so forth. And that indeed, as you mentioned, uh, relates even to a question of scientific traditions and scientific culture, which I had my last book uh, uh, written about, the the cultural differences between the natural philosophers in, in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century and then the applied physics uh, American tradition that evolved after World War II. There is a there is a big gap in physics. Uh, I would say even it changed from one science to another science. But um, well, I don't. I, th- that's an entire topic. I I would like I, I could discuss, but I don't want to to uh, to go into into details. Just um, one should keep in mind that it's um, it's at the end a a uh, philosophical question that circles back to the ideas of the beginning of the 20th century. If we think about where does electromagnetism come from and what are these basic questions and how can we possibly unify it with gravity and theories of gravity, this all, all, all this is, isn't of interest to the so-called modern physicist who does applied physics and wants to get things uh, running and uh, wants to build machines and applications and computer. All, all this is, could be irrelevant. But on the other hand, I think um, uh, real progress was always driven by that wish to get a proper insight how the, the laws of nature work on a fundamental level, not only by the wish, oh, I can build this and that from it. 
So uh, that being said, I mean, not, I think not only to the layman, but even to the to the modern physicist, or, or let's say to the contemporary physicist, it's um, it's important in the first place to explain why there is a problem. Why should we even care about these questions? Why should we even try to think about unifications of gravity and electrodynamics? Why should we um, try to understand electrodynamics from a fundamental level? Why is this interaction um, showing up with a repulsive and an attractive force? While gravity, we have only attractive. And, and so, I mean, today's fashion would be like, oh, we have these four interactions and this and that. And, and, and people, <laughs> I would say they try, they superficially try to unify when they speak about the four interaction, but because, um, that's, that's already kind of misguided and, and too complicated. So what, 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 in my view, we, we, we should do is, um, well, go to the very fundamentals. And, uh, if we think about electrodynamics, the obvious thing to consider is ether. Okay. Because that was the dominant explanation for the entire 19th century. And, uh, if you if you try to find out something fundamental, you have to go to history and have to look and consider what these very smart people thought about. And um, and well, at the end, my my take home message would be: the ether is something very interesting, and um, it it has been discarded for the wrong reasons. Not that I'm saying that it's the complete uh, fine theory; it explains everything, but there is something we yeah, we should we should take seriously. Yeah. There's a really yeah. interesting tradition in physics of arguing about the true burden of what an explanation looks like. Because if you go all the way back to Descartes, and I'm I, I've been harping on Descartes on the podcast a lot recently because we're working on this mm -hmm. book about material atomics. And I set mm -hmm. myself to the task of figuring out when it was that people stopped looking at the material mediator for physics. And mm -hmm. in order to figure that out, I had to actually trace all the way back and be like, well, hold on a second. When did they start to think about a material mediator? And it seems like Descartes was really the first modern scientist who sat down and was like, look, there have to be objects and the objects interacting have to be the causes of everything that we see. He like he didn't want to call them atoms because he he disagreed about their their mm -hmm. indivisibility, right? He's like they they have extension, therefore they are divisible, and God wouldn't have made something that was indivisible, so there can't be atoms. And that held for like fifty years before Newton came around and was like, we don't have to explain that. We these are the equations of motion. This is how gravity works. This is the foundation for what experimental philosophy is. It's us doing experiments, coming up with mathematical equations, and, you know, hypothesis non fingo, not our job to say what's happening. And then downstream of that, you had uh, the chemists that were trying to figure out atomic theory, basically, and they were trying to account for how it was that atoms were interacting together. And there was this. I think he was a Jesuit priest or he was a monk or something. His name was Boscovich, Roger Boscovich. And mm -hmm. Boscovich came up with this idea of the point atom. Are you familiar with it? No, no. So Boscovich was like, okay, there is a fundamental problem with atoms because atoms are by definition indestructible and so indivisible and we know that when you have two objects that collide they have to be able to deform in order to bounce off of each other and mm. if atoms are indivisible then at the moment of collision they can't deform and so they have to be moving both forward and backwards at the same time that's mm -hmm. impossible the way that we solve this is we solve this by treating atoms as mathematical point particles that have force fields around them. Mm -hmm. And the reason that not all atoms interact with each other at all times is because only atoms that have compatible force fields 
are able to bind with one another. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if this was like just some guy who was writing this, it would be one thing. But Faraday, as a chemist, was an enormous supporter of Boscovich's work, and he folded it into all of his chemical theories. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to actually explaining electromagnetism, he was steeped in this mathematical tradition at the outset, where he was like, there's no need to explain this, because the, the mathematical force fields that are around the wire are the same as they are in the atomic context. And we can just move forward with understanding that there are regions of force and that's enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which is all to say that like, it seems like there's a terribly short window of time where people were really genuinely preoccupied with explaining the material interactions. And so I always used to, last time we talked, I was like, how is it that everybody accepted when Michelson Morley showed that there was no luminiferous ether, that everybody was like, yeah, that's fine. But I think that it's because of this tradition where they had already been primed that like the math is enough. And so they show there's no ether and they're like, that's fine. There's just force fields. We can just yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there is all, uh, also a couple of interesting points. I mean, you know much more about the history than I uh, <laughs> in this respect, so it's very interesting. So I, I cannot even, I mean, comment on all what you said. It, it's interesting. But I think, uh, well, the part of the question of, of Sheila I didn't answer before was, um, how can we uh, bring in this uh, concept of a material and and um, how does that relate to electrodynamics? And all this is, of course, in the tradition we want to um, uh, we want to explain really how it works from first causes, and then not only we want also have a intuitive um, model of of reality. We're not happy with uh, mathematical abstractions. We are not happy with nature being absurd as today it's fashionable to say oh nature is absurd we have to put up with this um the the, the kind of thinking was very different back then and and people were were searching for real explanations and um they were of course doing uh, already continuum mechanics because it was well obviously non-trivial physics and and they got very interesting results there's also a big tradition of continuum mechanics like love and and yeah all these uh, green and, and mathematicians. So, um, well, I mean, I think it's very natural um, that you try to explain electrodynamics with these uh, ether models. And of course, at the very end, um, there is a problem if you think too materialistic. Yeah. And the, the um, preconception that you mentioned before, I mean, uh, both, I mean, if you if you start from this naive idea of bouncing balls that have to deform or not, or if you postulate entities with a field around that and the field somehow magically uh, attracts or uh, or creates a repulsive force, that both might be wrong. Okay, so we are all uh, struggling with models. And it, it might well be that we have not found the correct model of space-time or the microstructure of, of space-time. I, I still believe I have not found it, even, even if I think that uh, there is a, a, an interesting, uh, interesting pathway if you follow these ether theories. I think it's not really uh, resolved to the end. But maybe we can shift that, that counter-argument a little bit to the, to the end. Pardon the interruption, dear listeners, but we must ask you for a favor. If you like what the Demystify Sci podcast does, consider coming over to our Patreon. It is at patreon.com slash demystify sci, and there you can contribute a couple dollars a month to help us keep the ship running and allow us to continue our investigations into the most interesting ideas that are out there about nature, humans, history, the future, technology, economics, all of the things that we do on the podcast. In return for your donation, you get both of our episodes for the week early, you get to join our fantastic patron chat that meets weekly on Sunday mornings to talk about everything that is interesting in the world and the direction that the podcast should take, 
and you get to have the satisfaction of contributing to something that you think is important in the world. If you can't contribute right now, that is totally fine. We understand. I have been in that boat for many, many years. But what you can do without spending a single penny is come to our Discord, come to our Facebook, come to our Twitter, come to our Instagram, like, comment, and subscribe, because by helping us with the algorithm, you help us grow in a really super passive way. And if you've already joined the Patreon, just do all that other stuff too. For now, back to the conversation. Uh, what I what I want to say, or the message I want to um, to uh, convey is, um, the ether has has been discarded for the wrong reasons, and precisely uh, because people were imagining, okay, we have the ether as background space time, let's say, and then distinct from that ether substance, whatever it is. We have the material world with regular particles and atoms and matter and so on. And there was no connection. So uh, the problem was how, and that was, was the problem at the end with the experiments, how can uh, this regular matter move through the ether substance without friction and uh, at enormous velocities which were not detectable. And uh, so... Um, all this led to a, to a series of problems and series of contradictions uh, that led people to dismiss and dis discard the entire idea of of an ether, and that's wrong. Because I mean, if you think about uh, particles not as external substance, but as structures or defects or topological irregularities that can move in that ether substance, then you have resolved the problem. And of course, I mean, uh, back then, even Faraday could not imagine, I, I, I didn't, I, I don't think the, I mean, was a very smart guy, but certainly had no idea of things like dislocations or topological defects or, or the, the properties that these, uh, these structures have. So, and, and do you think, think that, that that's because those those material sciences showed up much later? Like people weren't thinking about a structured ether because they didn't have the material sciences yet to think about yes, these yes, sort of yes. dislocations. And yes, yes, dislocations are. I mean, they were. I think I guess discovered in 1934 or something. Just uh, yeah, material science. And Can then, we explain to people what who yeah, haven't? Yeah, seen I think that's essentially. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you have. If you have a, a, a picture of a dislocation, I have. We can put, we can put one up later. Yeah, so yeah, I can I can just, put one up here. Put it in in here just exceptionally. <laughs> I mean, I, I know it's a part. I mean, before but, all right, I do before we get to those though, why do you why do you think people weren't thinking about the structure of the ether? Why were they just simplifying it into this background fluid stuff? Is there a culture reason for that, or was it literally just that people weren't material scientists in the in the lattice sense that they are today? Well, I, I guess it's pretty difficult to arrive there from pure thinking, so to speak. Um, I, I think well, that it's I mean, really... No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit mistaken here. Um, there were people wandering about uh, structures or there were even um, this... Um, in fluid dynamics, we have these uh, defects and curls, and and uh, also the guy I mentioned, uh, Josef Larmor, who described a, a topological defect that was in 1906. So, um, not sure that would be a historically interesting study. Who actually was the first one to consider such irregularities in materials? From a theoretical point of view, I guess the well, or even just structure I, I, of the ether in general, like even imagining that something like that could have structure to it, it just seems yeah. like that that simplifying assumption undermined the entire project from the beginning. Well, look, I think yeah. it's really straightforward. The intervening substance between me and the light is not like this the substance that makes me. 
It is, though. It's it, atoms, right? It, it's, it's atoms, but then you have all of these discussions of, like, what is the void? Is the void yeah. even possible? What fills the void if the yeah. void exists? It's not intuitive to think of voids as being structured, basically. It, it, it's not intuitive to think that there is a substance that is not like the one that we can the, ponder the right because they call they used yeah. to call these like the imponderable substances yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that that's an accident i think that they're literally commenting on the fact that they cannot wrap their minds around yeah. what are the strange physical properties that give it the ability to act the way that it does and because they can't see it mm-hmm. they, they, there's just no ability to to model mm-hmm. it Mm-hmm. I, I guess at the end it's it's the tradition of of Newtonian science and Newton who de- uh, I mean he postulated he, he postulated also space and time let's not forget about that that are postulates and he postulated matter he did not really explain what is matter so okay we have matter obviously there is matter so uh, with the enormous success of Newtonian mechanics people obviously took that model for granted you have empty space and time running and these little balls of matter here and and that's it okay so it's it's i think it's kind of difficult to think about um these topological defects and structures and um well i, I it certainly it certainly evolved only after after 1930 1940 to describe these defects mathematically you can you give <laughs> Uh, take a lot of uh, 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 homotopy and homology theory to classify all these defects. But uh, I mean, but we should try at the beginning, I think, to give a, a intuitive description of what a dislocation is, which is for me is the most intuitive uh, type of defect. So um, maybe you can rephrase it in a in a in another manner with better English, but uh, an edge dislocation, if imagine a crystal, you have a cubic lattice and you just insert a half plane of atoms. So uh, there is, uh, well, just just one extra plane. And then, of course, that creates uh, irregularity because you cut something and you have to widen it and insert that plane and the rest of the material has to respond elastically. Okay. That's one type of dislocation. And the other one is what's called a screw dislocation is if you twist the material. It's like a little bit you can imagine as a circular staircase or you extend this staircase to a a parking garage with uh, different uh, floors and uh, the, the structure, the vertical structure you're driving around your car is the irregularity line okay and if you circle around one turn to pi then you are lift uh, you're lifted upwards for one floor yeah yeah that's that's the and the, and the reason we're focused maybe, on these maybe you can explain it in a better way i, I just want to just frame it like there, there's these are basic basic ways that you can deform a material in other words to change yes. its structure and the, the basic theory that you're finding congruence here is that there is mathematical similarity between the way that you deform a material and the motions that are embedded in our concepts of particles, which we talk about in, in basic fundamental physics. It's like the basic idea here is that what if these particles are actually these deformations as opposed to these you know, ineffable mathematical point units that contain a bunch of factor mm-hmm. information. It really yeah. strikes me how similar these dislocations are to knitting. Like, if you think about the way that knitting works, it's exactly mm-hmm. like this, where it's like if you're trying to shape a garment and mm-hmm. you have to be able, and you need the fabric to be able to lie against a curve, mm-hmm. you, have to mm-hmm. in, you have to do something, you have to use something that's called short rows, which creates mm-hmm. these linear dislocations that mm-hmm. are then stretched on the corners in order to create the curve of fabric. Or yes. if you're knitting you a can, hat, you can uh, make a kind of, a lot of nice examples here. I'm a little bit um, lacking the vocabulary all to express all this, but I think yeah, it's. Um, I think that fabric is like a really is a really yeah. straightforward way of yeah, thinking about it because you have to have like one uh, uh, thing ends and and the other continue. Yeah, there yeah. Are, there are lots of visualizations, and I mean of course. Let's not forget, I mean, dislocations are very 
very intuitive, uh, but they are still linear defects. They're not like point-like particles. So if you think about associating topological defects with particles, what you would need or would need to imagine is a closed dislocation line. So what is a closed dislocation, dislocation line? Um, uh, you can think of, again, of a material, uh, just uh, cut it in the inside, take something out, take a, uh, a surface out, and then again, let the material respond elastically. That would be a an edge dislocation loop. Okay, so this is like darts. This is like darts in a garment. Worry, just to explain all this. I mean, yeah. So this is like this is like this is this is this is a dart in a garment. Like if you've ever looked at a fitted shirt, Mm -hmm. in order Mm -hmm. to make the fitted shirt actually Mm -hmm. lie against the body, you have to take a slice of material out and bring the Mm -hmm. edges of it together to tighten that and to allow the rest Mm -hmm. to remain. Yeah. If you're knitting a hat, the screw mm-hmm. dislocation is the fact that as you're adding material around the circumference mm-hmm. of the hat, you can never return to the beginning of the row and have it yeah, match. Exactly. You're yeah, always yeah, yeah. one above. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, in yeah. knitting, in order to make those match, you have to do these mm-hmm. crazy things where you have to like expand mm-hmm. the stitches in mm-hmm. order to to you have to stretch them. Yeah. Like which is mm-hmm. what you're saying, which is that in order to yeah. get these things to fit, yeah. you're having to cut material out of one place and to mm-hmm. stretch material in another place in order for you mm-hmm. to have continuity with the addition of more substance that wouldn't be part of the crystal lattice otherwise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the thing is, I mean, how how did I get interested in all this stuff? I I wasn't even like that, oh, let's let's look at these ancient ether theories. No, it was that a friend gave me a book about this dislocation and dislocation theory, and it was obvious, oh, the formulas look like electrodynamics. Here you have kind of Gauss law and you have Stokes law, and that really, I mean, smells like that there is a relation to these uh, laws of electrodynamics. And then I was searching a little bit literature and and saw some, uh, searched a lot of papers, and there was one that particularly <laughs> electrified me, so to speak. It, that was the 1949 uh, paper by uh, Frank. And the guy considered the elastic energy that is created by this defect, okay? You have uh, the material response elastically, so you have an elastic energy you can associate with this kind of defect. And what happens to the elastic energy if you let the dislocation move through the material? Okay, so um, we have first to to explain what, what does it mean if the defect moves and not the material. It's like a wave in the ocean. So you, you can have... Uh, a uh, wave propagating through the ocean without the water itself uh, traveling over large distances. Okay, it's just the water that's just up and down, and the wave is is uh, traveling onward. And the same thing more or less happens with dislocations. They just you flip. I mean, one one half plane flips to the other and gets a new neighbor. So there is not not a big motion of the material, but the 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 defect can propagate through the entire structure. And now the guy uh, was interested, oh, let's calculate the the elastic energy, how it increases when the uh, velocity increases. And of course, since uh, this is elastic material, which has elastic constants and which has an elastic um, speed of sound, this, um, this structure can never exceed the speed of the transfer of sound. So this is already a little bit intriguing because you immediately think about, oh, there is a limit velocity, right? There is this. And you think about this, of course, the C, the, the speed limit, the velocity of light. And it turns out that the elastic en- energy of that um, of that dislocation correspond exactly to the relativistic formula, okay? You have that E equals mc squared. You can define an elastic um, you have the elastic energy, you divide it by C squared, and you define, so to speak, a mass of that dislocation. And that mass increases with the relativistic formula uh, squared over 1 over V squared over, over C squared. And that absolutely blew my mind because, you know, I mean, you you think about the ether and, and have you in your mind all these uh, so-called contradictions, the ether contradicting relativity. No, not only it not contradicts relativity, the very 
the very relativity comes out from that uh, elastic uh, properties of the ether. And that's really something that, I mean, I, I don't think many people are aware of that. So this is the first thing that, let's say, triggered my interest. In, and, and then I continued, of course, to what's behind there. And, and, and I mean, there is the obvious relation to the ether because we are talking about uh, dislocations in a crystal, but this is an elastic material and the ether is an elastic material, just with a little difference, but that the ether theorists didn't consider that kind of defects. But if you let the defects play the role of the particles, so to speak, everything fits at first sight. Yeah. And there's some evidence that Einstein played with one of these, uh, what would you say, dislocation theories? Yeah, and that, that's the other thing that, that came in. Einstein wasn't aware of dislocations, but that, that uh, subsequently, I, as I said, I, I uh, researched and looked up the papers, and dislocations were uh, discovered in the 1930s. And then in the 1950s, we are talking about the 1950s, they described dislocations mathematically with torsion. Okay? So what is torsion? Um, torsion is something that, uh, okay, if you have um, curvature in a material, you, you, you're you surrounding, you're doing a vector transport around a, a circular surface, and then at the end of the journey, the vector becomes twisted, okay? You have a rotation of the vector. That, this is curvature. And if you have torsion, the vector does not get twisted, it gets just shifted. This is the, the parking house I told you before. You make one circular line and then you got a shift in, in virtual direction. It's like a drill. Yeah, yeah. And and the funny thing is that um you have the you can link dislocation density to torsion, which is a concept from from uh, differential geometry. And so so to speak, either um torsion is the discrete version of dislocation density or dislocation density is the continuous uh, or torsion is the continuous version of dislocation density and torsion was considered by Einstein when he thought about a unification of gravity and electrodynamics you know I mean that's incredible because Einstein didn't know about dislocation theory. He didn't know about all the interesting analogies. He didn't know about the result regarding relativity. He didn't know about all this uh, similar formula to Stokes theorem and so on. But at the same time, he was considering that on, on, on poor abst for poor abstract reasons, he was considering that torsion um, that later turned out to be the equivalent of these uh, of these dislocations. And that was, so to speak, the, the second coincidence that blew my mind. And I said, that has to be something behind there. This, this is so interesting. That cannot be just coincidence. There must be, this must be the way to something very deep and, and possibly unifying between gravity and electrodynamics. And it's, it's exciting for the torsion because if I recall from your video, you were speaking about charge being defined as a sort of torsional deformation yes and that's that's the link back to electrodynamics yeah i mean there's there's a couple of things to um to tell now um i mean once you uh i mean once you realize uh, that connection it, it's of course something interesting to work on and of course then you go back to the history and look up the the uh in Whittaker's book, The History of the Ether and Electricity, um, I uh, looked up McCulloch's theory of the incompressible ether. And uh, I mean, the incompressible, that was a fine theory of electrodynamics. The only problem was it couldn't explain charges. So the, the, the guy got Maxwell's equation, so to speak, but without electrons. Okay, just fields. Everything, the rest is fine. So you have the rotation of the electric field corresponding to the time derivative of the magnetic field and vice versa. And you have uh, divergence uh, vanishes of the magnetic field and so on and so on. But uh, you had no charges. And that's, of course, is a problem, okay, because you have charges. So, uh, 
and again this problem can be overcome because it's uh, rooted in um in linear elasticity or let's say uh the if you write these equations of the elastic of the incompressible elastic ether of McCulloch in 1839 uh you do a kind of um well we are talking about linear elasticity and you're starting from the idea that uh you have a how do you say a um a displacement vector and then you have a displacement vector from an undisturbed state to a disturbed state and then you're considering uh, operation operators like curl of this of this um, displacement field and the the divergence of this displacement field and then you can associate this with uh, electric uh, quantities the problem is that um if you do if you do that vector analysis you're limited to small deformations okay as in linear elasticity and if you if you talk about real materials, if you if you want to deform something not just a little by one percent, but let's say uh, prolong it by a factor of two or something, you need nonlinear elasticity. If you go to nonlinear elasticity, there is a way to imagine a defect that corresponds to that to that um, to that source of of uh, the electric field maybe i it was very well these are uh, sort of propagating defects you, you right interrupt me at some point because it could be that i was no i just uh, i just want to periodically clarify to make sure that, we're, that everybody's yeah, following yeah. along so you're talking about in some sense chart you're talking about uh, in identifying these defects with particles you're talking about the them being sort of self-propagating defects right they're they're st yes. they're contained in a sense and they move spatially throughout the material mm -hmm. and it sounds like McCullough just didn't quite apprehend that aspect of it. Can we, uh, before we before we go there, can mm -hmm. we clarify for people what the defects represent? Because like we're talking about the elastic ether and we're talking about these defects, mm -hmm. but I feel like we haven't grounded it. A particle, mm -hmm. a particle. So it's the electron. I'm 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 talking about that a certain defect could have the properties of an electron or positron. Yeah. And and is like there basically trying origin? to explain particles by actions, activities that sure. are happening in this material? Okay, I think that that's a good so that's a good starting point. So basically, mm -hmm. if there is a defect that is inside of this elastic ether, then it can be treated as a particle that can act and move and behave because it's it's affecting the the things that are around it. The local lattice. The local lattice. That's a that's a good way of looking at it. So my it's like question: the lattice stays behind, but the de the changes and the deformation of the lattice, which are treated as defects, are propagating something like that. And so when we're talking about these equations that uh, McCullough worked out or Maxwell worked out, what is their relationship to the defects in the ether? Is it governing the yeah, way that exactly. they move that's through the, the point ether? I should clarify. Okay. So. In the theory of McCulloch, the electric field was a rotation of the volume element. Okay, you just take a volume element, you twist it a little bit, so clockwise, right? and that's an electric field. The electric field points that in the direction of the axis of rotation. Okay, so we have, uh, let's say, clockwise uh, would be positive and anti-clockwise negative electric field so um and the the magnetic field would be the motion of of that elastic material so the big problem is here uh if you it's a little bit technical again sorry if you apply the equations and say okay if you have the rotation of the volume elements how do you describe that you describe that by, by the curl of the vector field Curl is what also students learned a little bit uh, related to rotation, okay? As if we speak intuitively. So intuitively, you have that curl described by, um, that rotation described by curl. But if you then want to consider a piece of charge inside a sphere and apply, um, 
apply the uh, Gaussian law or say the um, the the one of Maxwell's equations say divergence of the electric fields corresponds to charge density, you get a contradiction because by definition in vector analysis, divergence of, of curl is zero. There is no debate about that. I mean, end of discussion. Okay. For so anyone is... that hasn't taken high school physics in a while, can we can we hmm? elaborate? For somebody who hasn't taken high school physics for a while, can we elaborate on this idea of curl and why it's important? Because you used it multiple times in your video, yeah. and I like sort of followed, but it's been a long it's been a long time since I've looked. You probably didn't do curl in high school physics. No, I, rem yeah. I remember this as being part of of what I, I learned. Mean, if, but if I you're doing no meteorology, paper. meteorology, for instance, you have a, a uh, uh, how to say a, a depression, <laughs> a bad weather turning around. So just just uh, like a vortex, yeah. mm -hmm. a vortex, a vortex. Then this uh, the velocity field of this vortex you can imagine as the curl of the vector field. Okay, just the velocity is the little vector, the little arrow, and then you imagine a vortex as a curl of this um, of this vector field so it, it's kind of intuitive it's a rotation yeah? yeah the problem is um i mean if you i mean how to say try to imagine the surface of a sphere and uh like the earth and then you take uh every piece of the surface and try to rotate it clockwise. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't add up because you can't rotate the entire surface of the Earth in a clockwise manner. Yeah, Because if you rotate clockwise here and clockwise here, in between there is, I mean, you, you're going to, to rip the material. Yeah, You create a, a distortion of the other kind, which mathematically would compensate, would annihilate the, the positive rotation. So... Um, if you stick to that to that um, to that mathematical definition of McCulloch, uh, electric field is the curl of the displacement vector. It doesn't add up, or let's say it's it's a contradiction, or at least it cannot reproduce Maxwell's complete theory because there is no way to describe electric charges. <laughs> In the real world, we have electric charges, so we, we do need them. However, so it's hard to make a totally negative. It's hard to make a totally one-way charged sphere that way using McCulloch's. Conception. Yeah, it's it's impossible. It's impossible unless it's un well. So, but the way that we're talking is we're talking about these regions on the surface of the sphere rotating. But if you changed mm -hmm. the definition so that it was along the lines of latitude, mm -hmm. then you could have laminar flow of of all of these different units rotating in the same direction, right? Without any conflict. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean. Well, at, at the end, at the end, uh, what is lacking uh, in in McCulloch's theory is is the concept of that defect because um, you can you can create a defect that acts as a source of intrinsically rotational strain. What do I mean by that? Um, you have to imagine uh, the uh, if rotation is an electric field, so a change of a of a rotation of the change of the electric field would correspond to applying a, uh, a clockwise torque to a material or an anti-clockwise torque. You can you can visualize that. Take a, a piece of um, well, any material and and just. Uh, I'm lacking the English words. I'm sorry, but maybe can you help? It sounds like you're taking the sphere and giving it an axis and just twisting it, basically. Yeah, you, you, you twist it like either. Which I this think is what Nasty was getting at, or that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do it in in, in both ways, yep. and and uh, that's what is needed. And uh, the problem is, how do you build this? Um, how do you build this defect inside the material that acts as a source of say um counterclockwise or counterclockwise strain um what you can do is and that's what what the the guy ernst lamo in 1906 proposed 
um, cut the inside of the material along a circular surface, twist the ends by two pi and glue it together again. Okay, so you have at the end, the glued surface is okay, it's, it's undisturbed again. What you have is a circular, um, a circular defect, but uh, the rest of the material, or, or if you walk through this defect, through this circular line, you would do that twist uh, of 2 pi, okay? So you're living in a world which is undisturbed, but if you're going through this defect, you're doing that 2 pi twist, and you again end up with, at your normal undisturbed state, but you have done the turn, okay? This is the kind of defect. So, and of course, you can you can do this in two ways. Either you have a positive screw sense or a negative screw sense. It's really like a screw, okay? You can either by 2 pi or by minus 2 pi, and that corresponds, that would correspond to the negative and positive charge, as we observe. So, I hope this is not totally unclear. Uh, I mean, I, it makes sense to me. I'm just trying to, I want to make sure that I understand the difference between this conception and McCulloch's conception. Is it, is it simply that it's, it's more dynamic spatially in, the, in this uh, updated conception? No, it's just that it's just that McCulloch did not con consider defects. I, I mean, of course, if you consider defects, you have a discontinuity mm. in your um, displacement field. Mm. Okay, so he thought about a steady deformation. I see, Every I point see, I see. is shifted to another point, but the the deformation field is continuous. Okay, and of course, if uh, once you introduce either dislocations or either that a defect I described, you have a uh, a singularity line here in which the um, the deformation vector is not defined anymore. Okay, you need that. That's, that's, that's an extra feature, mathematical feature of that kind of space-time, but it allows you to create these defect entities that can be seen as particles and at the same time are not foreign to that substance because they are just mathematical structures in that sub substance. It's like the, it's like the uh, dislocation boundaries form almost a surface, uh, like an interface, it seems like almost. With the ether, is that a reasonable yeah, way of looking at it? Interface, but it's one dimension or it's two dimensions less. I mean, you have the ether three dimension, and you have the the uh, dislocations would be a one dimensional defect. And if you, of course, if you consider circular lines, that would be still a one dimensional closed loop of a of a uh, irregularity. And then, well, I mean. To if if we really cleanly want to talk about this, what you you, you would need homotopy theory and tomology how to describe that uh, defect because it's 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 a three dimensional manifold. Okay, we have uh, space, but you have this loop, this closed line where it's not not defined any longer. Okay. I'm I'm confused by this idea of not being defined any longer and the singularity when it comes to the particle. Can you? No, can no, you... no that, that's not a problem. I mean, if you have a, a coordinate system on the Earth, uh, one coordinate is not defined any longer at the North Pole. Okay, so uh, if if you have longitude and latitude, um, you you don't have um, uh, you don't have longitude defined anymore at the North North Pole. It doesn't make sense. Mm. Okay, so it's a you can call that a singularity because it's mathematically it's undefined. Yeah. This is, I admit, on the sphere, this is a kind of a mathematically artifact if you want to switch to polar coordinates. In material science, it's something real because if you do the deformation, um, it's well defined in every point, but okay, just at a line, I don't know, I, I cannot say where the material has moved because uh, if I go a little bit to the right, it has moved, has moved up there. If I go a little bit to the left, it has moved over there. So there is a discontinuity. Okay. Yeah, that's why I was saying it sounded like an interface to me because it seems like a rip mm -hmm. almost in the, in the material. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you can, you can, I mean, you need to rip, you need to cut the material to, to form that defect. That's clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you end up also with a, with a, a one dimensional singularity. That's in it's such a yeah. That's it's that's I such an abstract uh, one dimensional singularity. It makes me feel like we're uh, we're talking about wormholes and stuff. But it's really funny when you mm. think about it, no, it no, it's as not just that a simple material just continuity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, well, I admit that um, you would need similar mathematics at the very ends to describe that cleanly. You need uh, homotopy groups. Um, one dimensional singularities. Then, if you embed all this, you can talk about two the second and third homotopy group, and that's fine. And, and, and people use that also for that fantasy fantasy stuff of wormholes on whatever. But I think this is, I mean, this is clearly motivated. I mean, everybody in, in material science, also the guys investigated, I don't know, uh, um, superfluid helium three or something. You have these topological structures, and it's just the math tools, the toolbox you need. There is nothing. Um, I mean, everything is testable, let's say here. Okay. Um, yeah, but if you want, that's the extra hypothesis hypothesis you need to introduce to get at a consistent picture uh, the, the, the extra hypothesis you need to fix McCulloch's theory of the incompressible ether because mm. it doesn't have particles and that's obviously something you, you don't want yeah you want particles so but what what you don't need is imagining particles as made of some external substance moving through the other substance either that wrong conception that uh well creates a lot of problems and lead people to dismiss the entire idea so what i'm saying is that by uh assuming this kind of defects this kind of topological defects which can easily move frictionless through the ether which reproduce the formulas of uh, special relativity then you can also have defects that act as sources of the electric field as imagined by McCulloch with the well tiny little difference that you don't you don't limit yourself to that um, linear elasticity of small deformations and applying that vector analysis if you you can uh, you just need to introduce large deformations and nonlinear continuum mechanics, and that's that's all fine. It's just it's not that this is contradictory. I can describe this this defect with clean mathematics. It's just going to be very very difficult. Okay, if you need if you apply nonlinear continuum mechanics. Can you break down for me why there's no friction in the propagation of a defect? Great question. Um, is it because you have that 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 interface thing we keep coming back to that discontinuity because of this uh, this singularity? Well, I mean, uh, what friction is in the ocean if, if a wave uh, passes? I mean, I okay. suppose the waters need to grind up against each other. A little bit, yeah. right? Like a wave. There will, is, will, in this case, there is an right? internal friction, but it's not a friction that is determined by the velocity of the wave, mm. right? Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. determined by the velocity, the respective relative velocity of the water particles moving up and down while Transfer the wave velocity. propagates. But this material material velocity has nothing to do, at least in from the outset, uh, with the with the wave velocity. Right, right. So it's not so, that there's no friction, it's just that the friction so isn't the one that just, people I mean, were afraid of. You can still imagine um, friction, but but you can still imagine just the flipping the flipping of these half planes occurring without dissipation of energy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know about I still feel like there'd be a little bit. Well, I but think that you're creating a what? reservoir of energy in the stretching of the matrix mm -hmm. otherwise, right? Because if you have this discontinuity and then elsewhere you have stretching, that stretching can compensate for the energy of the motion because as the stretching goes down, then I don't know. Well, it's also a closed system, right? Like the way that what these... What do you mean by stretching? 
precisely. Well, you were saying that there was, uh, in a planar discontinuity, that when you introduce this half plane of atoms... Actually, it's not a plane of discontinuity. It's a line of discontinuity. Interesting, because in the video you had like a cubic structure. Yes. But so you're using that... So in the cubic structure, the discontinuity is one-dimensional? Yes. I see. Okay. It's being lifted up, I guess. Uh, well, so fine. We can. We. I was for some reason I thought that it was like a plane of atoms that were extending into the depth of the of the cube yeah, that you yeah, had I mean, drawn there. I, I talked about I talked about the extra plane of atoms inserted in the material. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's atoms as the rest of the atoms. So it's it's this extra plane as such is indistinguishable from the rest from the other atoms. It's just that the the edge of that extra plane creates problems in the regular structure. Yes. And that's, but that's it's, it's a one-dimensional um, singularity. And okay? the, the stretching is, that I was thinking of is where you have that one-dimensional, you have, you have the line, that, that yes. or the, I guess yes. you could say the point, right? Because if we're, if we're talking about just a plane, you have the point, and then above the point, you have that the crystal lattice has to stretch in order to accommodate it. Yes, yes. Or yes. bend, if you prefer. And so yeah. there has yeah. to be some kind of energy that's in the stretching or the bending if we're talking about an elastic material. And if I think of a yeah. rubber band exactly. that's stretched, and exactly. then that's... there's, it, as, as it... Comp as it it's as a it... self-contained system, right? The, the ether of old was imagining this separate substance. Yeah. And, what, and yeah. all of a sudden, when matter is just re structures in that same material, and you're not losing any energy... Okay, so then the next question for me is like, so, okay, the ether has these discontinuities inside of it. Those discontinuities are what give r rise to matter. So is this a, yeah. is this a definition yeah. for matter? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Every, every, every uh, defect, every whatever you might imagine, uh, there are lots of defects, but you can, or take, take for example, close dislocation loop because it's, it's it reflects something like a particle. It's not a line anymore. If it's a closed line, you can uh, think of it as a particle. And of course, you have the, the bending and you have energy contained in that. And the elastic energy is exactly the rest energy, energy of a particle that, I mean, we can also observe released when it hits the antiparticle and then the the two defects of opposite of opposite um, sign annihilate and release the elastic energy in just yeah well waves that may propagate through the material yeah so i want to make one one thing i wanted to add before because you talked about the crystal structure this is a visualization mm -hmm. but it's not that space time has a preferred direction like crystal it's just that and this is the idea also of einstein and carton in the 1930s about their unified theory the idea is that you, uh, if you move in space time, you um, you have a distant parallelism. That means if you transport a vector around whatever path, once you return, you find yourself uh, with the same direction. Okay, the direction of the vector hasn't changed, but that does not mean that you have an overall structure with three x y z axes in a preferred direction. Okay. This is because you, you mentioned you mentioned the crystal before, and you seemed a little bit troubled by the fact that there are it's like a this this cubic crystal with uh, directions. That's that's just the visualization of the concept. And yeah. but you say that it doesn't apply. I didn't follow the explanation for why it doesn't apply. Um, yeah, are you just saying that space that the all right, first of all, we've started treating space time as the ether now, it seems like. Uh, but are you are you trying to say that the ether doesn't have a crystal structure? you're You're saying that you just use yes. these to represent subunits in the most simple way possible. Yes. Right? yes. it's not necessarily going to just deform in one direction or whatever. it's it has yes. it might mm -hmm. have a, a complicated subunit structure. Well, Almost certainly. Well, what does it mean? F what does that really mean, though? Because I'm like, it, it, doesn't it still have three dimensions of length, width, and height? No, no, that, that that's fine. We have still have three dimensions. That that's not a problem. I mean, if if I'm just saying that if you if you telling people, oh, uh, dislocations are interesting. Well, dislocations were discovered not in every material, but in in a you need a crystal structure. 
okay and a, and a crystal is is uh you don't have isotropy okay because a crystal has a well-defined uh planes and and directions so uh and this is obviously not the case with space time Okay. It's like the simplest mo it's like the simplest yeah. version possible to model it. Yeah. I mean, well, I think what he's, on, tr on, all he's on, trying to on, tell us hold on, hold on, hold on. I think all he's trying to tell us is that it doesn't have this nice cubic lattice. Oh, why? I don't think that it necessarily has to have a nice cubic lattice, but I guess I yeah. object to the idea that there isn't an organis a directional organization of space-time. Like so cuz when no, if I course, think about I mean, the material of course you can you can, you can con continue to talk about direction that's all fine. I mean no, that's just what like the literally on the like the crystal like if I was to think of it as being an elastic substance I would think mm -hmm. of it as having some kind of crystalline structure. Rubber like, is not crystalline. Are you sure? Yeah. About? I mean like it's got a repeating yeah. structure. That doesn't mean it's a crystal. Okay, so let, let's Crystals uh, are, let's are break regular it's all about symmetry in crystals. Crystals are defined by symmetry. Uh, but I mean like okay, so for example like if we think of something like uh, collagen. Collagen Not has a, a repeating yeah. helical structure. Yeah, but we can't yeah, call it a crystal. Yeah, I don't take that crystal. literally. I mean crystal. physically physically a rubber is a better model than a crust than a crystal. And you, you could also realize, I mean Inside a piece of rubber, you could also do that cut and glue process I described before, and have a source of uh, heavier electron, the source of the of the rotational uh, deformation. That you, that's fine. Yeah. You can have crystalline but, polymers, by the way. You can, mm -hmm. but not all polymers are crystalline. Yeah. I mean, the, the, look, the key to elasticity is those subunits have to be able to slide past each other and so forth. Okay. They, yeah. You need to have yeah. deformation, and so yeah. having some yeah. some chaos there allows for that yeah. motion. Yeah. When everything's like rigidly packed, really tight, it's very difficult to deform something yeah. like uh, yeah. like most crystals you think of. Um, mm -hmm. They're very they're not squishy. <laughs> I, th I think we should bring up another important point here because we are talking about um, we need to overcome the idea that we have this external substance moving through the ether and then we replace it by by defects and uh, hypothesizing that these defects act as particles. But uh, is this true and does this correspond to what we observe? Yes, it does. Hmm. As I said before, I mean, uh, particle creation and particle annihilation, I mean, these are I mean, fantastic phenomena. We ought to wonder about. We need to explain. So how to explain with a naive model of ping pong balls uh, the annihilation of particles? No way. But go to the defects and you have uh, defects that for, for for mathematical reasons have two two opposite signs you can do the twist either this way or that way so you have your minus charge and your plus charge and it's also evident if you bring them together the um, the two defects annihilate as two knots of the opposite signs annihilate and there is nothing left nothing left but energy that could propagate and could be released. I mean, that's a very intuitive, uh, that provides a very intuitive idea of particles. And not only uh, these kind of defects, they also lack individuality as quantum particles do. Okay. Um, once two electrons meet somewhere, be it entanglement or being the double slit experiment, you can't say, okay, electron uh, B entered and, and A came together, and then, uh, well, A came out that way and electron B came out the other way. No, there is no way to distinguish them any longer because they are identical. And all, uh, all physics phenomen phenomenology, be it from the calculation of, um, how do you call it, the, the heat capacity, or quantum statistics says that you cannot distinguish elementary particles. Okay, so and that precisely is it's, it's precisely the same thing then that you cannot distinguish dislocations once they pass uh, each each other. You know, because well, I... it, it just doesn't make sense if two or two waves in the ocean uh, are coming together and then separate again. So. Which wave came in? Which came out? No, I mean it's we're ju just two waves, but there's no no way to reasonably define an individuality. 
Well, you can okay. define individuality on the basis of, okay, so this wave was moving to the left and this wave was moving to the right. They met. Oh. And so you have this continuation of, of yeah, motion. You, and can, so you, can, you can't distinguish if there was a collision that deflected each and deflected it at right angles or they just passed each other without interfering. Okay. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm looking right now. So the reason that I was like, hold on a second, you can definitely have crystalline polymers is because my background is in protein biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And inside of proteins, you definitely can have these crystalline structures like uh, they're called protein folds, right? So you can have uh, beta barrels, you can have beta sheets, you can have uh, alpha helices, and mm -hmm. then you can have secondary structures where you have some kind of helical structure which then packs with other helical structures and it's part of this okay. amorphous environment and so me, when you're talking about these deformations what i imagine is i imagine that there is some kind of like like inside of a protein you have subunits and those mm -hmm. subunits are able to under influence from whatever's outside of them, and we can talk about that in a second, organize themselves into specific shapes. And I've always wondered if like knot theory has some application here, because I can imagine that uh -huh. the the substance of the ether folds itself into a particular kind of knot, which would be this deformation, which is uh -huh. then the particle. And the reason that you can't tell the difference between, you know, one electron and another electron is because the shape of their deformation inside of the ether is exactly the same. And you can uh -huh. then imagine, let's say that you have a, a really similar semi-crystalline polymer, which is you have like a lot of amorphous regions, and uh -huh. then you have basically a, a spaghetti region that goes that's packed tightly like up and down up and down mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, u-shaped mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. map on top of that or if you collide that with another u-shaped with another region that's packed in the opposite direction mm -hmm. then they disappear and they get they 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 add together and their structures are lost inside of the lattice Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that this idea of it not being crystalline is maybe is is important, but I imagine that there must be pure. I, I imagine that the deformations must be crystalline. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that analogy. I mean, if you're talking about protein folding, I mean, the, 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 you're talking about very huge molecules, tens of thousands of of atoms, right? And then the, how they fold and 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 form the three-dimensional structures. Very interesting. By side <laughs> side note, uh, done by by artificial intelligence. But I mean, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have always you have almost macros uh, macroscopical objects i would say here that that you could i mean you could name in this case oh protein max and protein john yeah uh, what i what i wanted to say look at look at the protein and if you look at two neighboring carbon atoms um once they their wave function interferes a little bit if there is a little bit overlap between the carbon atom at this position at the neighboring position okay they possibly can change positions and that's what you would also observe or calculate from physics results that you cannot once once atoms are uh, united in a, in a molecule you cannot distinguish them any longer okay you cannot say okay this uh carbon atom named a is at this position and this is at b is in that position because they may interchange are you sure about that because i feel I'm like sure if you about that tag that's, that's uh, quantum physics when, once they are sufficiently close together there is a, a non-vanishing probability uh, of of interchanging positions i mean i guess if we're talking about the Defi so if we're talking about these defects as being the cause of mm -hmm. particles and then uh, the as being particles yeah as being part sorry particle as mm -hmm. being what what we mean when we say particle and that they can move through the can i say lattice yeah or, and if they can move through the lattice without friction the lattice, uh, ether elastic i would i would prefer elastic, elastic ether. Continuum, okay yeah. 
So if they can move through the elastic continuum without friction, then what you're saying about the ability of the carbon atoms to switch positions must also mm -hmm. hold because it seems like there's no level at which the friction would then become prohibitive on the atomic level from them being able to move without friction to exchange. Is that kind of what you're driving at? Yeah, I mean, they're kind of different uh Things. One thing is we consider friction, and and there is the idea of the frictionless motion of that defect. And the other thing is that you cannot um, that that these defects have no individuality by definition. How do you f I mean? Um, how do you find a, an intuitive example? Maybe you can help, Shilo. Yeah, I got um, this. So, like, I mean, if you take like like bubbles are defects in water, basically, mm. right? And, mm -hmm. and if you like stick two bubbles on top of each other, you basically have one bubble all of a sudden. You're not going to be able to say even which bubble is which at some point. They're all mm -hmm. part of the same continuum at that point. I, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's an oversimplification of what you're saying uh, because, of mm -hmm. course, the the force vectors and, and the deformation propagates throughout the material and so forth. And but mm -hmm. But you're not able to separate these out. They're just activities inside of this I'm struggling uh, for a word, but and it's yeah, out of the ether. Idea. You mentioned knot theory before, okay? So imagine a rope, and you have a knot here and a an, an, an knot there, mm -hmm. and then you just uh, push these two knots together, and they mingle into one. I don't know, super knot, and then you're uh, you're again, um, uh, how to say, to, to you you un. You like you oh, push them you past separate each other. them again, yeah. and so what's the answer? Have they changed positions? The knot or not? It's 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 not a reasonable uh, question. You can't answer that because it's just the structure that uh, came together and again separated. But you're not the, the the fact that a knot is a knot has no individuality. No? Yeah, they're I, not I, separate I, materials from the ether. Yeah. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. most important take-home message. And that that was one of the most stunning results of quantum mechanics. Let's not forget about that. I mean, people were intrigued when when it first came out. I think it was by we're talking about Peter Debye and the calculations of of the heat capacity of metals. And then clearly, uh, once you consider entropy, I'm not don't have the details now but if you consider entropy and consider how many positions um the atoms can take you clearly see that you cannot distinguish uh situations in which you just interchange the atoms because it doesn't make sense quantum mechanically okay mm -hmm. so there is no individuality of of atoms and that's what we that's what we have here yeah so this also, I mean, potentially, let's say this idea of a particle is, yeah, we can use it uh, to, to, to think about quantum mechanics, how to describe quantum mechanics. Mm. Well, so there's this, uh, there's this famous quote where I think that it was John Wheeler who, in a phone call to Richard Feynman, proposed that the reason that you couldn't tell electrons apart is because they were all the same electrons. Yeah, this is yet another um, hypothesis that okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's really the same one because uh, but it's of the same substance, and the substance yeah, has an identity, yeah. and that identity mm -hmm. is what causes it to fold mm -hmm. up in the thing that is the electron, right? So it's mm -hmm. like you go to a river and you and you mm -hmm. look at the way that the rocks are sorted on the banks. And you mm -hmm. realize that all of the rocks of a certain size will end up in one place because of some identity of the relationship of the rocks to the water to the flow. Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. I imagine that it has to be the same thing when we're talking about the ether, which is that the ether must be made of something. If we're talking about deformation, if we're talking about stretching, if we're, it has to have component parts. And those component, the same way that you would inside of a protein where you have multiple... Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. the carbons, you have the nitrogens, you have the R groups, mm -hmm. and they're all like informing each other of mm -hmm. how they're fitting together. Mm -hmm. The ether must have that kind of similar structure. And so the reason that all electrons are the same is because the structure of the ether is the same everywhere. And they fold mm -hmm. up into whatever, whatever defect shape mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. same way 
everywhere all the time. And when they fold up in a different way, we by necessity have to call them a different particle. Then it's the proton, mm. then it's the neutron, mm. then it's the neutrino, whatever. Like mm. these are. I mean, no, no, I mean, it's clear that that the electrons are indistinguishable. They are all alike. No, no debate about that. I'm just, I'm just wondering if that particular quote of Wheeler is really helpful to to get new insight in the matter. I mean, what is what what we need to think about, and you mentioned it, is what is at the very end the substance the ether is made of? What constants does it have? What material properties? I said that we have to, if we follow the analogy, we have to associate the speed of light with the speed of transverse sound. By the way, that's why we need an incompressible ether, because otherwise we would have a second uh, speed of sound of, com um, of compression waves that would well, wreck the whole theory to <laughs> to to different. You'd have two speeds I mean, of light. Speculate yeah. about, but I think it's it's you have to you have to stick to that picture of the. Uh, can you guys elaborate on that for people? Like, why would you have two? Why why does it need to be incompressible? I just want to make sure that everybody who's listening, because I we, I feel like we can have this conversation at a relatively high I, level, yeah, okay. but I want to make sure I mean, that people you, are. There following. are two different kinds of waves. You have compression waves. In earthquakes, there are primary and secondary waves, and the first wave is just uh, pushing, uh, and then you have this well. Uh, it's like sound of higher density propagating, uh, uh, propagating, uh, but you have a higher and lower density in a compression wave. Okay, if the material is incompressible, you cannot compress it. There is no wave of higher or lower density to move on, but you still can have shear deformations okay you can uh, deform it like this Up and then down. of course the shear waves can propagate without interfering with the with the local volume elements they all maintain their uh they remain incompressible but you have um you have these shear waves and by um by uh cogent reasons uh the velocity of of compression waves is always higher than the velocity of shear waves. That's one of the basic results of continuum mechanics. You just end up, I don't know if you do the math, it's like a factor of, of square root of four over three necessarily appearing here. So, um, well, I mean, you could still try to build a model of space time on that, maybe, but. Uh, if we stick to the observations, we have this speed limit in nature of the of the speed of light, and it's very natural to relate it to the speed of transverse sound in this case. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, where were we at before you you stopped us? We were talking about the necessity for understanding the structure of the ether, ah, and right, you were saying that right. the incompressibility tells us something. Yeah, about we can the learn something about the stiffness, right? So, there's been a few people who have who have back calculated the stiffness of space time by sort of modeling it as if it's an elastic solid. There's this guy, uh, Kirk McDonald at Princeton, who did a really good paper on this. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, but, he, but there, uh, even even historic example, I, I think Lord Kelvin, Lord Kelvin was the one who also calculated the density of the ether it just just lord kelvin as we talked at the very beginning of motivation who was the one who said i don't want to explain something i don't understand light with something i do understand even less so this <laughs> whatever electric field whatever i should imagine this so he was one of the guys he, who wanted that kind of real understanding of, uh, as a matter of principle. But this is a sideline. So uh, if we want, uh, I mean, the natural thing is then to, to ask uh, yourself, what, I mean, what is that ether? What's, what kind of substance is it? And even if you have this um, velocity of transverse sound, which is fine, but then you calculate it usually from two um, properties. The one is the density, and the other one is the elasticity. So you have uh, the uh, square root of elasticity divided by uh, density. Take the square root, and you have the speed of light, a sp speed of transverse sound. But what is this density of the ether? What is the elasticity of the ether? So you're again in a situation in which you have to put up with this, I call it God-given numbers that come from somewhere. I mean, 
who said that the elasticity is this number and who said that the density is that number. And that is kind of unsatisfactory. Also, if the rest of the ether theory can be fixed and particles can be fixed and the motion can be fixed, the relativity is fine. But this is still a problem in my view of this ether approach because it somehow naively thinks that we still have a three-dimensional space-time, we still have that matter, we, even if it's the invisible ether, but there is still something, yeah, we can do uh, these calculations. And I don't know how to how to fix that, at least in this, I mean, in this paradigm, let's say, of the of the ether. I think there's a few things that we can say. I mean, in order to get a really fast wave uh, in a material, let's say, and the speed of light is unbelievably fast, right? We said it's the speed, it's the fastest speed we are aware of is possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need a really stiff substance. I think that's that's the biggest contributor to wave speed. This kind of transverse wave yes. speed is stiffness. Yes. And so we're talking about something, the stiffness yeah, I mean, of I mean, which is just unimaginable. Stiffness divided by divided by density so like a really low at density very material. low density you can also with moderate stiffness so to speak at a high speed of transverse oh, sound but yeah. somehow, so one or the other somehow the density should also reflect or relate it to the density of real objects so you're right you need you need that enormous stiffness there well if you have really low density you would expect it to be compressed it's hard for me to imagine a very rarefied substance that is not compressible unless it's, it's under tension yeah yeah, it's possible. There are, there are even funny substances. I think Veritasium has made a video about that kind of modern materials, very low density and very stiff at the same time. Really fantastic mm. material. I mean, but yeah, I mean, let's say you don't, you don't need to wonder, you don't need to worry about that because I mean, at the end you need a, you need a, a, a speed of light or a velocity of transferred sound and that, that's it. I mean, the problem is uh, not that it's high or it's low. The problem is the very fact that you have to postulate some arbitrary number. You don't know where it comes from. That's the problem, the epistemological problem I have, still have with the ether. Uh, you should check out Kirk McDonald's paper because he goes through, I think, five different methods of calculating the stiffness based on different phenomena, you know, observed phenomena. Um, actually, maybe we can, can you... Pull that thing. Can I check I've been trying to find a list of incompressible yeah, substances. Yeah, pull up Kirk McDonald's paper because he calculates it. I forget what the different uh, methods he uses are, mm -hmm. but they all converge upon you know pretty high numbers like ten to the fortieth gigapascals mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. just. Un um, so he's 10 got to the fortieth gigapascal. That's a lot. Oh, uh, sorry, ten to the twenty seventh pascal, uh, ten to the thirtieth pascal, uh, ten to the this one's 10 to the 96th cosmological sound waves he uses and calculates, uh, okay. you know, 10 to the, uh, geez. I mean, I mean, we, we this is, this one's on earth on labs on the earth. We have now uh, gigapascal, 10 to the nine, 10 to uh, hundreds of gigapascal, 10 to the 11. Already strange things happen here. We produce molecular hyd uh, uh, metallic hydrogen, but I mean, <laughs> still orders of magnitude away from that. I mean, we don't know what happens then. Um, yeah, but it's inter I mean, it's interesting what you're saying because I wasn't aware that there are experiments or phenomena that um, allow you to de determine the stiffness because you have no information on the density. So he must make certain assumptions on the density to arrive at the stiffness and vice versa so i thought the ether i mean once you deal with the ether you just put the numbers together whatever it is and the only thing you can measure is the speed of sound okay but yeah okay you might also have some assumptions but um well the problem is whether it's reasonable or not it's at the very end it's a non-measurable it, it's an arbitrary number you don't you don't know where it comes from. That's the problem. Except that you know that it's there, and you know that the waves are extremely fast, and therefore you're talking about yeah. something. Yeah, I mean, that, you can do yeah. wonderful physics. I mean, that's that's um, out of the question. Um, I'm, 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 
well, I, I'm kind of strict here because, uh, you know, I have this, uh, call it philosophy. I don't like arbitrary numbers. I think constants of nature have to be explained. So if you go back to the, I mean, what, what, what fascinated me was that Einstein and Cartan used that uh, torsion um, in contrast to curvature. They focused on torsion to arrive at the theory that unifies gravity and electromagnetism. Okay. And so uh, if you use the torsion, if you think about these locations, you arrive at the ether. So, but still, what you need is if you want to have a unifying theory somehow you must calculate the difference of the electric and the gravitational force okay take the hydrogen atom you have the electric force of the proton and the electron and it's 10 to the 39th stronger than the gravitational force between the uh, proton and the electron how do you get this number so every theory that somehow unifies that somehow encompasses both forces that somehow somehow solves the problem must calculate this number otherwise it's just blah blah and playing with math and whatever but i mean we need the hard facts here i mean and um uh, I think we talked about already in the other video. The only the only quantitative idea in this respect is Dirac's uh, large number hypothesis, who is who relates this number ten to the thirty nine to the size of the universe and the size of the proton. But um, yeah, I don't see any. I don't see a, a, a path how to link how to get this together. The idea of the ether, and at the same time encompassing also ideas of Dirac's or ideas of Ernst Mach that the nature of gravity is related to the masses in the universe. I just cannot bring this together. So that's why I, at the very end, think um, even it's very, very interesting and, and it's, it's a lot of phenomena could potentially be explained. I think at the very end, it's too naive to think about a model of space-time based on that, well, like rubber in a in a three-dimensional space. That's that's too naive. I think that this is a fascinating thread to pull on. Uh, let's take a really short break. Mm -hmm. We are delighted to announce that Demysticon 2024, our very first scientific conference, is officially launched and you can buy tickets right now at the link in the description and also in the link that is up in either this corner or this corner. We are going to gather in Austin, Texas on April 7th and 8th of 2024 for two days of talks on consciousness, mythology, archaeology, solar physics, hypnosis, and much, much more. Buy tickets now up at this link. Uh, I sent you the paper, the uh, McDonald paper, where he derives the stiffness of space-time. Yeah, I, I I read the section three of the paper. Now it's it's kind of a nice idea that there is a way to to relate that back. Well, um, well, I. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can we can talk about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say section three, which section do you mean? Uh, where where he calculates, so to speak, the the stiffness and and the density of the of the ether, if he just puts in the constants of nature. Oh, so so uh, I see, I see, I see. Just before just before the appendix, that's cosmological sound waves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's stiffness. A quantum. Oh no! It's sorry. Uh, section two, not section three. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, Excellent. So yeah, can you explain to people what he does to calculate this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, uh, you need if you think about the ether, you need a justification for these uh, constants of nature, and one of the constants needed is the, the stiffness or elasticity or in uh, units, it's Newton per square meters. 
And the other one would be density kilograms per uh, meters per cubic meters. So now, of course, you can generate these units um, for the simple fact that by combining the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and Planck's constant, uh, if you put these uh, three together, you can reproduce meter, seconds, and kilogram. That was already noted by Planck uh, around 1900. So, of course, so Newton is kilograms um, times meters per second squared. So, if you can uh, reproduce each of these three basic units, you can also do combinations and arrive at, in this case, Newton per square meters or even kilograms per cubic meters. And if you do this, you arrive at these huge numbers. Now, why are these numbers huge? Because uh, Planck's units are very small at the time and the length scale, and the mass scale is very, is very high. So um, it's possible. I have some reservations regarding um, Planck units because I think I mean it, it's it's fine. It's wonderful that you can derive meters, seconds, and kilograms from it. It's okay, but I think they. Uh, distracting a little bit from a proper understanding because we must first explain the gravitational constant. The gravitational constant is likely uh, to originate from all other mass masses in the universe. This is not a majority opinion, but I think uh, if you want to explain the, the uh, gravitational constant, the only reasonable possibility is if we link it to the mass distribution in the universe, and there is good evidence for it, so to speak, because if you put in the numbers, it's roughly uh, the speed of light squared times the radius of the visible hor horizon divided by the mass included in the actual horizon of, of the cosmos. So this coincidence uh, speaks in favor of explaining uh, the gravitational constants um, in, in terms of Mach's principle. And once you do that, uh, um, Planck's, uh, Planck's units are a kind of artificial uh, construction, which is a little bit uh, yeah, distracting from, from, the, from a proper view. And so, but nonetheless, you can do that and can use these units and uh, arrive formally at uh, the density you need and the stiffness you need um, for this ether. That's possible. And of course, you end up also with the speed of light C. That's the purpose of the, <laughs> what you want to obtain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about deriving the fundamental constants. Yeah. So speed of light, we can pull from the stiffness of the substance. Can we say that the, the, the maximum you need speed of light need is a stiffness and density? But can we say, is it fair to say that the, that the speed of light is a, is a constant of the universe? In a vacuum? Uh, yes and no. I guess maximum speed of light. It, it is, a, it is a, a speed limit. It is the maximum speed. It makes also sense in this ether concept. But um, as I have pointed out elsewhere, <laughs> what we talked about, um, uh, variable speed of light is also something very interesting. I mean, you, you have a local speed of light, of course, but uh, if you look at the entire universe, it makes also sense um, to, to consider variable speed of light and, uh, and take that variable speed of light as a reason of gravity. And all this circles back to the idea of calculating the gravitational constants by the mass distribution of the universe. So these ideas are linked. Once you think about getting rid of the gravitational constants and calculating it, you can do... The only reasonable thing is to make also uh, the speed of light, um, the speed of light variable, okay? The problem is not that um, that the speed of light is, is variable, or I mean, you you can you can even define it in the metric system, 
simply by um, the, the propagation of electromagnetic waves. And that's what, what's done in today in today's system. Um, you, you just fix that number, 299792458 meters per second. And, uh, but you cannot, you cannot detect a speed of light because, um, of course, the frequencies and wavelengths change accordingly. Okay, so um, well, I don't want to dive into the details of the variable speed of light stuff. Uh, uh, let, let's say that uh, you can. There is, as a matter of principle, there is a, a possibility to calculate the the gravitational constant, but it's not possible to calculate the a numerical value of the speed of light. And it's not possible either to calculate a numerical value of Planck's constant. So this is the the the, the wall, so to speak, so to speak, you hit when you try to uh, when you try to to get rid of this constant. Okay. Like you can't you you feel like you can't make the speed of light fall out of gravitational uh, phenomena in isolation. Is that what you're saying? E yes, I mean that's that's part of it's part of a larger uh, discussion about epistemology, epistemology and how to arrive at a fundamental theory. The thing we need to do is to get rid of these arbitrary numbers in nature, which are called fundamental constants, but they are still not gods. Okay, you you, you don't want that. So if it's possible you can think about calculating the fine structure constant 1 137 i have no idea how to do that but as a matter of principle let's say it's possible i have no idea how to calculate the proton electron mass ratio but as a matter of principle you can do that if you have a, a genius that comes up with the theory and the result is 1836 eh, and so on it's fine so uh, and you can also, as a matter of principle, calculate the gravitational constant, but you cannot um, calculate C and H because they are related via Planck's uh, units to our meters and seconds. Okay, so uh, once we accept space time uh, 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 as space and time, and you need units here meters and seconds uh, you have to somehow invent these these units and the only way to do is uh, to assign certain values to the speed of light and Planck's constants two constants that give you two units meters and seconds okay that's just a, just a little bit generalizing if you if you ex once you explain the gravitational constant can you, can you remind me the units of Planck's can, hmm? can you remind me Planck's units What's the how, units how of Planck's constant? Planck's units? Uh, what is the units of Planck's constant? Joules per hertz. Uh, the the units is Newton uh, meters seconds. I see. Newton because uh, joules per hertz is is correct too, um, or Newton Newton meter seconds, or alternatively, a uh, kilograms uh, square meters per second. We'll also be fine. So you basically, it sounds like what you're saying is you're like, look, these other things you can derive without needing to use arbitrarily defined units. And you're saying that the idea of a mm -hmm. meter and a second are arbitrarily defined units, but mm -hmm. you're not mm -hmm. saying that kilogram is an arbitrarily defined unit, are you? Or it is? That's another, that's an, another um, important topic. Um, is are you are you getting tired? Should we just record? Can we record no, no, a second no, one of these? No, no, it, 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 it's fine. It's, it's okay. I mean, maybe not too long, but <laughs> yeah. I just these uh, are. We spend so much time thinking about these things, and you are the mm -hmm. only person in the world who is also thinking about them. And so I feel like I could talk to you for days. And I just I know <laughs> okay. that it's late. I'm very happy. You're very friendly. I, I yeah. That's, yeah, I probably I probably should have mentioned like I did my PhD in elastic mechanics and I started I was teaching intro physics at the time and I started realizing that there was these insane corollaries between like we used a torsional atomic force mic microscope in in my lab and I was just <laughs> realizing that like these uh, these equations were so similar to to the quantum equations that I was teaching 
uh, mm-hmm. in, in the summer. And, I, and it just struck me. And I, that's when I really got into McCulloch for the first time. And, mm-hmm. and nobody cared about McCulloch in the entire universe. I think I, it was so hard to even track his book down. And so I'm just, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really excited to have you here and, and be mm-hmm. interested in the same kind of questions as us. It's, mm-hmm. it's not every day that you meet somebody who, who even thinks about mm-hmm. things in these mm-hmm. terms. So mm-hmm. I appreciate it. No, you. I mean, but, 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 since this time we talked about the ether and I think that's it's an interesting topic, but it's also enough somehow. I mean, we could, we could do another meeting about the issue of calculating constants, how to get rid of, uh, of constants, why we should do that in the first place. And what's the what's the possibility? What are the possibilities? And what are the principal um, the principal limits of that approach? But that, uh, that yeah, we should cover that maybe in another in another um, meeting if you want. Yeah. Um, just to to conclude with respect to the ether, um, I think uh, yeah, y- you can do that calculation. You can imagine a stiffness. You can imagine a a density. But still, you need to postulate a number, and I don't uh, see how you can do that in a satisfactory way. And at the same time, I don't see a possibility to unify gravity to electromagnetism. Even if Einstein was on that track with torsion, I think it was somehow close, but the problem persists we don't we don't get this uh 10 to the 40 this Dirac number the relation of forces and i don't i have yeah I, um, I don't think um we can continue with this naive model of of the ether it's fine it's it's uh, really interesting and it, it provides new insights but it's not the the final solution to everything mm. i think yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about the the idea of mass being applied to protons and electrons and so forth. I wonder if we could we could pick up there next time because there's mm-hmm. there's a lot to be said and and I think that there's a lot of confusion that's resulted from that. I mean, because when you think about why you know, mass is original. Well, let's not do it. Let's save right? it for another I time. Just, it's I such think, a big topic. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alexander, I, I, I think, think you're that, totally... that really merits an, a separate discussion. I also make my mind a little bit up for that okay. other stuff that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's plan on having another another talk. Yeah, so. I hope you're satisfied. I mean, yeah, my one take-home message could also be, I mean, there is something we need to think about with respect to electrodynamics. I mean, you can do a lot of technology and have a nice tools for everyday life and uh, live happily. But at the very end, we have that riddle. It's still on the table. It's not solved. It's why we do have we have that particular kind of force where does it come from and what's the what's this very structure we haven't discovered that and and, um, yeah just encourage people to to continue to think about in that direction it's not useless i don't think so yeah definitely we talk a lot about how important it is to have good models of what's happening so that people can think about how to build stuff on the basis of that like I always go back. Yeah, it seems like if you had a material model of fundamental reality, I just feel like you'd have a lot more engineers. Like it just be you could visualize it, you could imagine it, and it, it mm-hmm. would probably be easier. It, it would open the door to a lot more people to care about fundamental physics and perhaps even mm-hmm. de- you know develop technologies related to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that being able to see something. If if there's anything that I've learned about physics, is that physics goes in this stepwise progression of idea first and then someone develops the mathematics that you can use to play with that idea yeah i love that i love that yeah yeah, i always say this i mean you have the you have kind of three steps here uh what what a fundamental what a revolutionary progress is and uh the idea is the one usually underestimated yeah you have newton's idea oh the gravity that pulls the apple down might be the same force that is responsible for the orbit of the of the of the moon okay you have no math at this point yet but it's just a fantastic idea and then you have to formalize and it's sometimes very hard you need sophisticated math and so on be it 
be it the, the uh, Kepler problem with the ellipse or be it uh, function spaces in quantum mechanics. And then you work out this formalism and, and usually the formalism is overestimated, you know, the math. And uh, this is, uh, but the idea is uh, also an important element. And at the very end of a, of a scientific revolution, I think it's all, also a simplification, yeah? a unification and simplification. Actually, the two numbers he unified was, well, little g, the gravity on Earth, explained by, or all the little g's, let's say, on different planets, unified and merged into one big g, the gravitational constant. Yeah, that was his basic accomplishment. And so, but I, I, I really like what, what you said before, yeah, the, the idea and, and, the, and the mathematical formulation, that's, that's what happens. And I think yeah. that it connects to what Shiloh was saying, which is that, and you as well, which is that the equation is what matters for engineering. And I think that that's why it gets more play because that's the thing that somebody uses who's like, I just need to build a tool. Like I need to do this thing. And they reach into the toolbox and they like wrestle around and they pull out mm -hmm. like tensors and they're like, okay, great. This is the tool. And they do that. And they don't ever sit around and be like, well, how, who made that tool? They're just mm -hmm. like, no, it's a tool. Obviously it's like some fundamental thing of the universe and I can just do it to do things. And I, like, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it, but mm -hmm. I feel like they're hammers and it's mm -hmm. worth sitting around. Some people are just going to be interested in how the hammer got made. And that's just, yeah. I, I'm definitely one of the people who wants yeah. to know how the hammer was made and I'll use the hammer as soon as I understand how it was made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. very cool. It's great to have people in the same spirit here. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Thank you. Right, so we have a few more mysteries to unpack, so <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for staying wonderful. up late with Thank us. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night. All right. Good night, Alex. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.